Hi, welcome to NASPGAN Quality Module 1, QI 101, How to Get Started. I'm Joshua Gossett, and I'll be your instructor for this course. The North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition would like to acknowledge constant contributions to the modules provided by Joshua Gossett, Elizabeth Williams, David Galloway, the project lead, the NASPGAN Clinical Care and Quality Committee, including KT Park, Narelle Riley, Shazad Saeed, and Jim Hybe. A little bit about myself, I've been in nursing for more than 10 years. I have more than five years of nursing inpatient administration and management experience, four years in a formalized quality improvement role, and I have a Six Sigma black belt. In this course, we'll be covering the following items. An introduction to the initial steps in quality improvement methodology, a review of the common tools used in QI work in the healthcare setting, and some examples of application of these tools into a real-life simulation based on improving ambulatory clinic waiting time. Please note that the slides with the cartoon image of people waiting are slides where we will be applying what you are learning to the clinic example. So what is quality improvement? The Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, defines quality improvement as systematic and continuous actions that lead to measurable improvement in health care services and the health status of targeted patient groups. This should not be confused with quality assurance, which is instead meant to monitor a standard of quality that has been previously established. There are various methods used for quality improvement process. Think of it like having a few different toolboxes at your disposal with different but sometimes similar tools in each one. A few examples of what we hear about or see frequently in the healthcare world are the Model for Improvement, Lean, and Six Sigma. The Model for Improvement is the one that we will be illustrating during this talk and applying to our clinical simulation. It consists of two main principles. The first is asking three questions to establish a framework for the improvement that you want to conduct. Number one, what are we trying to accomplish? Number two, how will we know that the change is an improvement? And number three, what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? The second principle is testing improvement ideas in a cyclical pattern that results in learning from each intervention. The first question in establishing a framework for improvement is to ask, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? This means that we must explore the background of why we are convened to work on the process. What's going wrong? What outcome is not where you want it to be? What are the pain points that people are feeling, particularly the customer? The next question to ask is, how will we know that our changes result in an improvement? There can be no improvement without observation and measurement, so we will need to establish something that we can collect and quantify that will show us if we are making a difference. Does the measure already exist that captures the problem, or does something need to be created? The final question is, what changes can we make that will result in the improvement? This is intentionally left as the final question so that the scope of the problem and how to measure it have been clearly established before we think about how we can alter the system to make change. It's important to establish a current state baseline before making changes so that improvement resulting from interventions can be observed in the measure. Now that we have identified the framework we will be using for our improvement work, we will start to apply it using the Quality Improvement Roadmap. This roadmap consists of eight different steps. In this module, I will be reviewing the first four steps in the roadmap. The following four steps will be covered in module two. The first step in the roadmap is defining the problem. Oftentimes, participants in improvement work will naturally try to jump ahead steps mostly because we like to be problem solvers and tend to bring our own perspectives and biases into the work with us. However, quality improvement is the stepwise process for a reason. In the beginning, at least, it's important to clearly establish the framework of the project. Creating a problem statement can be difficult for some because of the reasons just stated. Often, we hear problem statements such as, the problem is that we just don't have enough people, or we just need a checklist put in place here. While those two statements reflect ideas for intervention that may be indeed needed, 
they are not in themselves problems. Challenge the team to really identify the problem that these interventions are trying to solve, while also harvesting and acknowledging the ideas for improvement to use later on. Applying this idea to our simulation, we would want to reframe the problem of we need to decrease wait time to something like waiting time is too long, or our patients feel that our waiting time is too long. Just in this example, you can see that there is a lot of opportunity for confusion and misdirection if the problem is not thoroughly defined. If we go with waiting time is too long, then we need to ask for who and why do we feel like it's too long? If we go with our patients feel waiting time is too long, then we might alter our measure from a measurement of time to a survey or some other more subjective measurement to capture these feelings. For simplification, we will be using an objective measure of time for the clinic as opposed to a more subjective measure. After defining the problem, the next step is to select the team that will be performing the improvement work. There's no such thing as an army of one in quality improvement. It takes a team approach to fully scope out a problem coordinate data collection, and to actually implement interventions to change the system. There are a variety of groups to consider when performing improvement to a system. Number one, the first is the team that will actually be doing the improvement work. They will need to have their time appropriately allocated to improvement so that they can consistently participate in the project. The second is the peripheral set of process stakeholders that are either organizationally responsible for the area of improvement or will significantly be affected by potential changes. The third is the customer group or groups. This can be external customers such as recipients of goods or services, or it could be internal customers that are members of the organization but have downstream roles from the improvement target. In our clinic example, the working team is made up of the physician, a clinic nurse, the clinic manager, a technician, and a patient. Examples of stakeholders might be hospital administration or the division leadership of the clinic specialty. It's often a good idea to include a patient in the work so that they can offer their perspective as a customer and a recipient of the output of the process, whether it's goods or services. Once the groups have been established, we can then move on to mapping the process. After assembling a team, the best first step to take is to create a visual representation of the process that will be the target of the work. Typically, this is best represented as a process map. This is done for a few reasons. Largely, though, because it assists in identifying buckets in which failure can more easily be identified. Another reason is that it assists the team in clearly identifying the scope of the process that will be improved a clear beginning and ending point. It is very easy to get carried away improvement and you want to solve every problem in the entire value stream. In our clinic example, I have created a mock-up process map including the following steps. Patient walks into the clinic. Patient registers at the front desk. Patient has vital signs taken. Patient is placed in the exam room. Nurse reviews the history and current medications. Physician visits the patient. Nurse gives an after-visit summary, and the patient is then discharged from the clinic. The assumption in this module is also that the patient has an appointment already. After mapping out the process, the team should conduct the exercise of brainstorming the different things that can go wrong in each step of the process. Particular attention should be paid to issues that do or could potentially result in the problem that has been identified as the focus of the improvement. A 
A good way to start this is to place the process map that has already been created prior up on the wall. Then you can conduct the discussion either with an open forum or by allowing individual work through letting members place sticky notes up on the wall map with problems they see with each step. The approach for this is very dependent on team dynamics. The goal is to obtain universal participation, capturing as many perspectives and problems as possible. Once failure types or modes are identified, then they can be quantified through observation of the process and collecting data on the frequency of the issues. Data that is collected in this way is often displayed in a Pareto chart so that the failure modes can easily be prioritized by frequency. Once frequency is determined, the team should start with the most frequent failure and conduct a root cause analysis on why that failure is occurring. The goal is to get a system level fault in the process that is enabling the failure to occur. Then interventions can be designed around correcting this. A simple way to do this is by asking the question, why? At least five times sequentially to why the failure occurs. There is a tool known as a failure modes and effects analysis that is used in industry and healthcare at times. It's a detailed and complex tool that allows for failure identification, cause and effect determination, multi-factor prioritization and mitigation. Often healthcare professionals find that frequency is inadequate by itself to use for prioritizing failures for intervention, especially when talking about failures resulting in infrequent but high impact results such as patient injury or death. The FMEA can account for these types of failures using its multifactorial prioritization matrix. A word of caution though, the FMEA can be cumbersome and lengthy to teams and potentially could lead to disengagement. So use good judgment when applying this tool to those that have little or no improvement background. In our clinic example, you can see that I have added failure modes beneath each step in the process that were identified by the team. Please take time now to pause the presentation and review the failures that were collected. After collecting frequency data on the failures, we can put them into the Pareto chart for easy visualization of the problem areas. You can see the failure categories on the x-axis, the count of each failure type within the green bars, and the cumulative percentage of the total failures represented as a red line over the bars. The most frequent failure was then used to conduct a simple 5Y root cause analysis. The resulting conclusion appears to be that the original process design of the nurse being solely responsible for cleaning the rooms is contributing to the issue of rooms being unavailable. Lastly, we'll move on to identifying the aim. Answering question two in the module for improvement is all about measurement of the problem. The goal is to be able to visualize change and apply statistical process control rules to process output so that we can understand when we have successfully improved the problem. If data does not already exist that reflects the problem, then new collection will need to be started and an amount of data will need to be gathered before changes to the system are made so that there is a point of comparison for future improvement. In our example, we have collected data around time in each step of the process to formulate a baseline for comparison later after interventions. You can see that the average total time is 123 minutes, including wait time and process time. Process time is averaged for each step, and then the wait time, the time when nothing is happening to the patient, is calculated as the difference. It's time to solidify our framework for our improvement once the baseline data is captured and validated as representing the problem we are trying to solve. So, we need to create a goal for what it is we want to accomplish. In our clinic example, we decided that what we really want is to decrease the average waiting time from 90 minutes to some unknown goal in 6 months. We aren't quite sure at this point what is an attainable goal, so we denote the goal as Y until a goal can be thoughtfully determined. Two main factors should be involved in determining a goal for improvement work. 
The first is, what can we accomplish in the allotted time for the improvement work? The second is, what is it that our customers want or expect? Sometimes we can pull benchmarking data for understanding what others in our industry do. In our clinic example, we pull 20 patients and find out that they feel a wait time of 60 minutes is reasonable. So, now we have completed our aim statement to say that we want to decrease our average waiting time from 90 minutes to 60 minutes in 6 months. As stated before, question 2 in the model for improvement is about data monitoring and measurement. What signs will we see to know that our changes have had a positive effect? This is where we need to make a choice about what tool we will apply to our data to monitor for improvement. Traditionally, the simplest form is a run chart. A run chart is a simple line graph or time series with the measurement of interest on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. There is often a center line, usually the median, and a goal line. Here we have begun our run chart for clinic waiting time. We have established our baseline and our first data point to be 90 minutes, which is the red line. We have also established our goal to be 60 minutes, which is the green line. We will continue to come back to this chart as we progress in our quality improvement journey and test interventions to change the system. To summarize, in this first module, we have reviewed the initial steps in a quality improvement methodology, specifically the model for improvement. We have reviewed common tools that are used such as process mapping, Pareto charts, and run charts. We have then applied this method and its tools to a simulated scenario of clinic wait times. In the next module, we will continue on in the model for improvement and discuss building a theory for improvement using a driver diagram, identify interventions, testing through PDSA cycles, reviewing the results on a run chart, and implementing the changes. Here are a couple written references that you may find valuable to have as resources for conducting quality improvement work in healthcare. In addition, there are a few online resources that are well written and useful. Thank you for your time and attention during this module. Please feel free to proceed on to Module 2 to learn more about how to conduct quality improvement in the healthcare setting.